Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from the Savior who willingly gave up his life for you, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The text for us to ponder for a few moments this morning comes from the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, verse 32, which reads, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? This is the word of God. To begin with this Mother's Day, I want to share with you a story written by Kathy Klingman. Going to an affluent high school wasn't easy. I watched with envy as many of the rich kids drove their parents' sports cars and bragged about where they bought their designer clothes. I knew there was no chance for me to compete with their wealthy status, but I also knew that it was almost a crime if you wore the same outfit twice in a month. Coming from a family of five with a tight budget, allowed us little hope for style. But that didn't stop me from badgering my parents that I needed more fashionable clothes. My mother would frown at me when I say that again. Do you need them? Yes, I would say adamantly. I need them. I really need them. So shopping we would go. My mom waited outside the dressing room while I tried on the nicest clothes we could afford. I can recall several of these necessity trips. Mom always went without complaining, never trying on anything for herself, although she'd stare at the clothing on the rack sometimes. One day when I was home, I tried on one of my new outfits and modeled it in front of my parents' full-length mirror. As I was trying to decide what shoes looked best with the outfit, my eyes wandered to their closet which was partially open. What I saw there brought tears to my eyes. Three shirts hung on my mom's side of the closet. Three shirts that she'd worn endlessly and which were old and faded. I pulled the closet open a little further to see a few work shirts of my dad's that he had worn for years. It had been ages since they bought anything for themselves, though obviously their need was greater than mine. That moment opened up my eyes to see the sacrifices my parents made for me over the years, sacrifices that showed their love more powerfully than any words they could have said. End quote. Now, I'm sure this story touched many of you as it did me. For one of the ways my mom showed her love for me was by her willingness to do without in order to provide a little bit more for my brothers and my sisters and me. A mom's love, more often than not, is kind of like that. It's a sacrificial love, a a love that will sacrifice of time and energy and money and, and sleep and almost anything else in order to better meet the needs of her family. Moms so often will do without themselves so that their families can be better taken care of. I'll always remember my mom insisted that she was already full and didn't need that last piece of dessert so that I could have it. A sacrificial love. That's what we celebrate on Mother's Day, really. But you know, someone else is like that, too. And I'm sure you know who I mean. God. For God's love for us truly is a sacrificial love. He was willing to sacrifice, too, for the welfare of his children, for our welfare. In fact, he made the greatest sacrifice of all for us, for our well-being. He gave up his one and only son for us. And when I say that, I want you to hear me say, for you. Now, you parents that are here this day, I want you to especially think about how difficult that must have been for God. 
You moms think about how hard it must have been for God to do such a thing, to give up his child, his only child, his only child that he dearly loved, to give him up into death. Now, of course, I am a parent. I've been blessed with six children that I love deeply. But I also care about other people, too. So when I found out about people who might need a little help, I'll gladly do what I can to help them. And if it'll cost me a little bit of money, you know what? I'll probably do it. And if it'll cost me some time and energy, you know what? I'll, I'll probably do that. But if it would cost me the life of my child to help someone, I don't see how I could do that. To give up my life, maybe. But I couldn't give up the life of my child. That would be a price too high to pay. And I want you to think about that as you think about the love that God has for you. For he loves you so much that he paid the unbelievably high cost. And he gave up his son for you. He gave up his son, and not just into death, mind you, but into the ugliest death this world has ever come up with. For God gave up his son into the mocking, and the spitting, and the lashes of the whip, into the crown of thorns, and to all that other abuse. And he gave him up to the cross, and, and then into death, and literally into the pain of hell. And he did this all for us, all for you, so that you could be forgiven of all your sins and still be able to spend eternity with him in his heaven. Now that's some kind of love, my friends, a love that would do the unbelievable. Just think of it. God gave up his one and only son to the cross for you. And I'm stressing this today because I want you to know that you can trust in this God who gave up his son for you to continue to love you and take care of you always. Our text asks a powerful question, a penetrating question. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him Graciously give us all things. You see, our text wants to take the anxiety out of our lives by reminding us of the fact that if God was even willing to give up his son for us, something that cost him deeply, something that cost him more than we will ever understand, then we can be absolutely certain that he will continue to provide for us and take care of us always. Something he can do easily with no real cost to himself. Our text wants to impress upon all of us the certainty of God's love and care. I mean, if he gave up his son for you, obviously he'd do anything else for you too that you need, that is good for you. And if that's the truth, here's the question. Why do we worry then? Why do we spend so much time in worry? A former men's basketball coach once said these words. Everyone's worried about the economy this year. Hey, my hairline is in recession. My waistline is in inflation. And altogether, I'm in a depression. Now, that's kind of a humorous way of putting things, but I think it illustrates an important truth. We can always find things to worry about. I mean, think of the things that we're worrying about right now. Is, is America in decline? Will tension with China or Russia lead to war? Will Social Security be there when I need it? Are our energy costs going to continue to rise? Are our food costs going to continue to rise? What if I lose my job? How am I going to make ends meet? And what about our public schools? Are they doomed? Will crime and evil afflict my family? Are they going to afflict my neighborhood? It's not hard to find things to worry about. 
and worry about them, we do. More and more, it seems we are consumed with worry and anxiety. Very few people seem to be able to go to bed anymore with a heart that's at peace. Instead, we'll waste a good night's sleep to worry. And then we'll waste what could have been a productive day for God's kingdom to worry some more. Is that true for you? And it's also unnecessary. I mean, how will worrying about things help you? Will it change anything? And here's the real question. Why would we worry when we know there's a God in control of everything that happens? A God who loves us. A God who even loves us so much he nailed his one and only son to a cross for us. Why would we worry at all? You see, worry robs you of the peace God wants you to have. Worry interferes with the work that God gives us to do each day. Worry, in effect, denies that there's a loving God there watching over us and taking care of us. Worry does no good at all, and it hurts us in so many ways. So why do we do it then? Especially when there is an alternative. You see, according to our text for today, all we have to do to overcome worry is look to the cross. Look to the cross of Jesus. For as we mentally gaze at the cross and see Jesus, God's only son, dying for our sins there, that's when we know. That's when we know that God truly does love us. That's when we know that God would do anything necessary to help us. No sacrifice is too great. That's when we know that everything is all right and going to remain all right. That's when our hearts can be filled with peace. Thinking about the cross is the alternative to worry. When I was a little child, there were some nights I had nightmares. And inevitably, when I got one of those nightmares, I'd wake up in a panic and start screaming for my mom. And she'd come and sit beside me on a chair between my bed and my brother's bed. And as soon as she sat there, I could quickly go back to sleep. You see, I just needed to know that someone was there, that someone was there who loved me. And you know what? We adults need that kind of assurance too, don't we? And the good news is that God does indeed love you, and he's promised to be with you always, and he will, make no mistake about it, he will always take care of you. So when worry strikes again, just look to the cross. Realize again God's great love for you and know that he would do anything necessary to help you. And let your heart be filled with peace once again. After all, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? And the answer to that question is, he will give us all things. He will give us everything we need. May your heart trust that promise and be at peace. In Jesus' name, amen.